Good evening and welcome to the Dali Museum. My name is Kimberly McQuarrie and I am the Director of Community Programming and we are honored to be able to share with you tonight this special lecture, Witnessing History, the Meaning of Holocaust Era Photography. And this is part of our series supporting the Lee Miller Exhibition. Our guest speaker tonight is Ursula Zapinska, the Director of Education and Research at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Prior to joining the FHM 17 years ago, she worked at the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and at the State Museum at Madonik, on the site of the former concentration and death camp in Lublin, Poland. As the head of the FHM's education department, she is responsible for teacher, student, and community education, including docent-led tours for various audiences. She leads the Shoah Victims Names Recovery Project at the FHM in cooperation with Yad Vashem, she has collected and submitted over 700 pages of testimony from local survivors with data about victims who perished in the Holocaust. Sapinska is also on the FHM's team working with USC Shoah Foundation on the Dimensions and Testimony Project that records survivor testimony in a format enabling people to ask questions that prompt real-time responses from pre-recorded video interviews. She received the 2011 Outstanding Achievement Award from the Florida Association of Museums for her contributions to Yad Vashem's Shoah Victims Names Recovery Project, and she holds two master's degrees in Holocaust studies. Please join me in welcoming Erla, Ursula Zapinska. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, and everyone at the museum. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here, so I really appreciate the invitation. Let me take off the mask. <laughs> Can ever, everybody hear me well? Yes? OK. So today we will talk about the meaning of Holocaust era photography. Um, it's a big subject. I uh, will focus on some examples of photographs, different themes, authors of the photographs. Obviously, we won't cover everything, but I hope I will encourage you to do your own research um, later on. I will start with our mission statement, um, the mission statement of the Florida Holocaust Museum, because we do everything um, within that mission statement. So you will see references to it. You will recognize them throughout my presentation. Obviously, we, um, oh, it's automatically changing. Um, uh, we investigate what happened, and we honor the memory of the innocent victims, men, women, and children who were murdered in the Holocaust. And we use that information to draw lessons and um, uh, bring those lessons to our lives so that we can see um, how we can do better in the world around us and in the world uh, we build for future generations. <clears throat> I'm also bringing up the definition of the Holocaust. Um, there were other victim groups, non-Jewish victim groups, um, during the Nazi regime, but the Holocaust was the systematic state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its allies and collaborators. Um, it's very important to remember that difference. I will be focusing on the Holocaust today, on the Jewish victims. I also want to point out the time frame, 1933 and 1945. Uh, we will look at photographs from the wartime, um, from the time of World War II, but we need to remember that the Holocaust started much earlier, in 1933, when the Nazis came to power and the persecution of Jews um, started right away. So uh, we will be looking at some pre-war photographs for that reason as well. Now, I want to open with this picture, um, or two pictures, um, of the Sass family. You are looking at Magda Sass with her two daughters, um, uh, Judith and Emilia. Emilia is the younger one on the left, um, and you can see Judith with Magda on the right. They were Hungarian Jews. They um, used to live in the town of Mishkolz in Hungary. Um, you can see the dad in the picture, but they were a family of four. Um, so mom, dad, and two daughters. They had a regular, a regular life in Hungary. 
And um, I will get back to this picture later in the presentation, but I'm using it as the, um, the opening because we will be looking at, at a lot of suffering and death today um, in the uh, photographs, but we need to remember about life before, the world that was, that was destroyed. Those who were tormented and murdered had a life, had their joys and sorrows, some people had families, some did not, um, some had careers, some um, stayed at home, like in any society, in any group. Obviously, they had neighbors, non-Jewish neighbors as well, and um, those relationships have not always been easy. Um, there were time of pogroms, uh, there were times of pogroms and, and expulsions, but um, at that time, um, before the Holocaust, families like the Sass family had a regular life um, that they thought they would continue to live. And that um, was disrupted because their fellow humans chose to hate them and target them. But we'll get back to this picture later. I want to start with the concept of propaganda. Nazis um, were very heavy on propaganda. They understood that it's important to use propaganda materials in order to um, convince those who are still unconvinced um, to accept their ideology and to strengthen the message that they were um, sharing from the very beginning. You are looking on the left at Heinrich Hoffmann. Um, he was Hitler's personal photographer and um, his career as a photographer, professional photographer, goes back much longer before um, the Nazi party was even established. He owned a photographic shop in Munich by 1909. He was also a press photographer. Um, he was a photo correspondent during World War I when he was conscripted into the German army. And he joined the Nazi party in 1920, um, became friends with Hitler, and became his most trusted photographer. So every photograph, official photograph, that we know of Hitler had to go through his approval. Um, Hitler trusted him. Um, obviously, he would um, have um, uh, he would make decisions which photographs to to publicize. But um, Hoffman um, produced posters, postcards, um, books like the one that you are seeing here. Um, um, even postage stamps had an image of Hitler created by um, Hoffman, and he received royalties from the usage of um, Hitler's image. So he became a millionaire very quickly, but um, he was the key figure that is often forgotten um, behind the image that the Nazis wanted to share of Hitler, of the Nazi party, um, and uh, as I said, the um, emphasis on propaganda was extremely strong. Hitler um, wanted to make sure that his image is the way he wants it to be in order to um, catch people's attention and um, convince um, uh, people to join their ideology. Another figure um, that was very important for Nazi propaganda is Leni Riefenstahl. You may have heard about her, uh, one of the um, key figures in Nazi propaganda. She was a dancer, actress, film director, photographer, um, who um, created several Nazi propaganda films, including The Triumph of the Will, the most well-known. Um, Hitler was very um, impressed with her skills. Her films um, show a lot of new techniques. Um, so uh, to this day, they're analyzed from that point of view. And uh, she maintained that she did not want to make those films. Um, she lived to be over 100, so she was interviewed multiple times after the Holocaust. And she maintained that she never wanted to make those movies uh, or those films. But um, at the same time, when you look at her um, comments about the Nazis and about Hitler from that era, she is praising him all the time. Um, another of her films, uh, this is another um, shot in the co left corner, um, 
from the triumph of the will. But um, um, obviously you see Jesse Owens at the top of the screen. Uh, this is a, a, a frame from um, the film called Olympia about uh, the Nazi Olympics of 1936. Um, again, a Nazi propaganda film about the Olympics. Um, she, um, after, after the uh, Holocaust claimed she didn't know anything um, about the Holocaust, when actually, when Olympia was promoted in the United States, it, it coincided with Kristallnacht, uh, the night of broken glass, the pogrom against Jews in Germany, um, prepared and carried out by the state. And obviously the news was covered in the United States. She was interviewed and asked about uh, Kristallnacht and she publicly defended Hitler. Um, now, she also made a, feed, uh, a, a movie, um, a feature movie um, between 1940 and 1944, and she used as extras um, Roma and Sinti prisoners from an internment camp uh, who were later deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And uh, she still claimed that she didn't know anything um, about uh, their situation. So this is um, um, very briefly um, uh, an introduction, introduction into the idea of Nazi propaganda, how important it was at the very top of Nazi leadership. But uh, Nazi propaganda was also used by um, other members of German society. You are looking at a picture here from a German town called Norden, and you have a woman and a man in the center, Christine and Julius, um, she was not Jewish, he was Jewish. They were engaged. They were both born in Norden. So it was their hometown and uh, were a couple in love. They had plans for their future. Um, what happened that day in July of 1935 was that they were marched through their town in broad daylight, as you can see, uh, with residents, non-Jewish residents of Norden. Uh, following them, um, they threw stones at the couple, pulled their hair. They had to um, carry signs, um, both Christine and Julius. Um, there are other frames um, uh, from that film, and we know that, that um, Christine also had it around her neck at some point, and she also gave a testimony after the Holocaust, um, saying that they were uh, race defilers because a relationship between a Jewish person and a non-Jew was not acceptable. Now, in 1935, in September, the Nuremberg Clause would be um, adopted that made it illegal to, to have a relationship like this. But this is July, and as absurd as, as, and ridiculous as the, that law was in September, um, they were not doing anything wrong in July, and yet they were already targeted. And as you can see, we, uh, the res non-Jewish residents participated willingly um, in that persecution. Um, a drugstore owner took those pictures and then uh, displayed the prints in the windows of his drugstore. So their humiliation continued even after um, this incident. Um, you can see German police participating. They were arrested. Um, so. Um, that was not the only couple that was treated like this. And again, we are not talking about wartime yet. Um, we are talking about mid-30s, um, where Jews were openly attacked, uh, persecuted, and those who associated with them um, could uh, face uh, what um, Christine was experiencing here. Now, um, the wartime um, photographs show how the situation escalated um, during that time. We are looking at a picture here from Poland. Um, when Germany invaded Poland, uh, Poland had the largest Jewish community in Europe, over three million Jews. And Germany had its military goals. I mean, it just started another world war, and yet, they also focused right away on the persecution of Jews. So um, Jews seen in the streets would be attacked, um, ridiculed. What you are looking at in this picture is a group of German soldiers um, cutting off a beard of an observant Jewish man. 
um, ridiculing him, humiliating him. They are happy in this picture, as you can see. They are laughing, smiling, looking at the camera. Um, that was something very common right away from the first days of the Second World War. And again, later on, there would be um, um, theories or comments that the soldiers were not involved in anything. And you can see pictures like this as evidence how um, innocent human beings were targeted right away. Now, this is a picture of another um, a photographer who wasn't a professional photographer, um, but he was obviously involved and affected by the Nazi propaganda. Um, uh, his pictures are from the Lodge Ghetto, the second largest ghetto um, during the Holocaust. His name was uh, Walter Genewein, and he was the chief accountant um, in the Lodge Ghetto, the chief accountant of, of the German um, administration. He was also a, an amateur photographer. He loved taking pictures, so um, he uh, took it upon himself to take some pictures. He was mostly focused on how successful the ghetto was in the sense of um, delivering work for um, the German war effort, because obviously there were um, laborers in the ghetto that were used for uh, German companies that would open workshops in the ghetto, um, making uniforms, etc., etc., anything that, that could be useful um, to Germany. But at the same time, he took pictures of um, street views, like the one on the right. You can see a street uh, in the Lodge ghetto. And um, deportations into the ghetto. You are looking at a picture of Western European Jews being deported to the Lodge ghetto. You may be surprised by seeing a passenger train, but early on, those passenger trains were used because um, the Nazis did not want to alarm um, uh, Western European Jews who were deceived and told they will be resettled in the East, they will be able to work and live. But obviously, if they were put on a boxcar, it would be very alarming. So just to deceive them even more, um, they would be transported um, by passenger train. Uh, these are some of the workshop pictures that I mentioned um, that Genevain took with, well, obviously, he had color film for these images. You can see on the left, um, laborers in the ghetto of different ages, including children, very clearly marked with the yellow star. And on the right, you can see men and women weaving straw boots. Those boots uh, were put on top of leather boots of German soldiers um, after the invasion of the Soviet Union because they were not used to the winters um, in the former Soviet Union. So um, ghetto residents would be weaving those boots for the German soldiers. We will get back to that picture on the right later on. Now, another example of amateur um, photographers um, can be seen in these pictures. They were taken by a tourist in the, in the ghetto. Uh, believe it or not, there was a phenomenon um, called Wehrmacht tourist or soldier tourists. Um, these were German soldiers who were stationed um, near or in towns with ghettos, and they would go on their own to the ghettos to take pictures out of curiosity. Um, one of them was Heinrich or, or hein, Heinz Jost. You can see his pictures here. Um, he treated himself to a, a photo excursion into the Warsaw Ghetto, for his 43rd birthday on September 19th, 1941. He took over 100 um, photos in the ghetto. Um, he, um, he was supportive of Nazi ideology. Um, he believed in what the Nazis um, um, expressed about Jews uh, throughout their propaganda campaigns, how filthy they are, that they are vermin, that they are rats, um, that they are parasites, a threat to um, German society um, and German culture. Uh, so when he went to the Warsaw Ghetto, that was his lens of looking at these people. Um, obviously, you can see um, dead bodies in the streets, um, overcrowding, and that was what he was showing. Um, no empathy and um, 
a very negative um, light in uh, in which he was um, showing the residents of um, the ghetto. Now, did every German soldier have this um, approach, this negative approach? No, these are pictures taken by Joe Heidecker. He was a German soldier, but he was an anti-Nazi. And um, he actually, with his parents, spent a year in Poland, traveling around Poland in 1937, um, and remembered that year as a kind of year of freedom, because obviously for um, Nazi opponents, being in Nazi Germany in 1937 um, was very difficult, with lots of restrictions. Whereas while traveling in Poland, they could read what they wanted, they could say what they wanted. Um, they stayed in some Jewish homes um, during that trip, um, and th that was his experience with Poland before the war. Now he was in the German army, and um, he was stationed with a German propaganda unit in Warsaw, um, and decided to go into the ghetto to see for himself what it, what it was like. Um, he was shocked by what he saw. Um, he um, remembered those Jewish friends. He remembered um, um, the Jewish communities from 1937. Um, he said that he took the pictures because he was worried nobody would believe him what he saw. Um, and uh, he said he was shocked. Uh, he felt shame. Um, he felt powerless guilty that he's not doing enough um, to help them, um, but he was taking pictures as, as um, evidence of what he saw. Um, he did not um, share them uh, until publicly until 1981. After the war, he settled in Brazil, and then in 1981, he published those pictures for the first time. He said he couldn't bring himself to do that early on. So, such um, 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 attitudes and approaches um, were also possible. There were um, soldiers who had empathy, but uh, the majority of the soldiers visiting ghettos were um, like um, we saw in the pictures of, of um, Heinz Just when, when um, they were just reflecting or confirming um, their ideas about Jews, um, ideas that were built on um, anti-Semitic ideology that the Nazis used. Obviously, the Nazis did not invent anti-Semitism. It's often called the oldest hatred. And the Nazis used some of the old stereotypes against Jews, but they um, built um, on that and um, expanded on that. Now, I want to move into pictures taken by professional photographers. Um, you are looking at pictures of Johannes Halle here. He was um, a member of a uh, propaganda company. These were companies uh, that included professional photographers um, who were given specific tasks um, in the army. Uh, he was stationed in different places. On the left, you see um, Lublin in Poland, uh, in occupied Poland. You can see Jews walking with armbands. Uh, there are German soldiers in the back. And on the right, you, had, you can see a picture from France. Um, he took part in the invasion of France as a soldier. And um, he also took pictures like this. What you are looking at are um, residents of a town called Lubny in Ukraine who are about to be executed. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left um, residents of Lubny lining up. Um, their belongings are in the background. Again, they were deceived that they would be relocated and they were encouraged to take uh, their belongings, which would be taken away from them. Um, you see German personnel in that picture, and on the right, there is a woman holding her child with other residents of Lubne um, behind her, awaiting their execution. Lubne um, had a, a small Jewish community, and uh, that's 
these are pictures taken right before um, these innocent human beings would be shot. He was also, um, the same photographer was also in Kiev um, around the time of the Babi Yar massacre, one of the largest um, mass shootings of Jews during the Holocaust. Our museum has a program next week um, to um, mark the commemoration of the massacre. massacre. I encourage you to watch it online to join us. What we are looking at here are pictures of the belongings on the left of um, the victims. And on the right, you see um, Soviet POWs forced to level the earth on the mass graves. In this picture here, which looks like a sea of belongings, there are German soldiers rummaging through those belongings, um, looking for valuables uh, that could be sent to Germany. Uh, the better uh, clothes would be also sent to Germany. Um, the worst ones would be auctioned off to the local population or given to collaborators. Um, now, what's interesting is that uh, Johannes Halle um, did not give that film from Kiev and Babi Yar to his supervisors. As a member of the propaganda company, he would give the pictures um, to his supervisor, uh, but he kept this role um, to himself. Um, he did not survive. Uh, he died near a French town called Cannes um, during the Allied invasion of Normandy. And um, his widow sold the pictures to a, there are two versions, one says to a um, German, um, German journalist, one to a widow of the journalist, but um, fast forward to the year 2000, uh, Mrs. Schulz, uh, the widow of the journalist, um, uh, sold the original photos to the Hamburg Institute for Social Research, and that's how they became public. Um, so it's interesting that um, Halle did not share that, that role with his supervisor. Now, another set of pictures showing a time of atrocities um, is the album created by SS General Jürgen Strop. Um, he was assigned to um, complete the task of the final liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, his predecessor failed and um, Strop um, was uh, adamant to um, carry out that task. Uh, he had at least one photographer with him. Um, that photographer um, was allowed to come up close, um, even in the combat areas. I, I'm showing here two pictures from the album that Strop created. Um, obviously, the um, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising started um, on April 19, 1943. So um, the um, Germans um, were met with opposition from the insurgents. Um, Jewish um, insurgents were hiding also in the bunkers, as, as did um, other people underground um, trying to survive, um, but Strop would make sure that every house would be checked. Those houses were uh, set on fire. Uh, people would be jumping off, um, trying to avoid the flames and dying. People would be pulled out from the hideouts, like in these two pictures. Um, and you can see again, uh, German personnel on the left in that photograph, laughing, smiling, um, being proud of what they, what they are doing. Um, Straub created three albums um, from those pictures taken by the photographer. Uh, the, there were over 100 pictures. He chose over 50 for the um, so-called Straub album. Um, he made three copies, one for Heinrich Himmler, one for Kruger, um, uh, who was the supreme commander of the SS and German police in the general government, and one for himself. Um, when he was caught, he had the album and the extra photos um, on him. The other two um, copies were also retrieved and were later used um, at, the Nuremberg trial, at the Nuremberg trials as evidence. Strop is visible in several photos in that album. He is proud of what he did. Um, he called the album, um, The Jewish Quarter in Warsaw is No More. 
Um, he was proud of what he accomplished in his eyes. Um, these insurgents were not people to him anymore. They were subhumans. Um, Jews were subhumans according to Nazi ideology. So um, that's an example of how um, even in the midst of um, fighting with insurgents, that propaganda was still there and the need to um, document it uh, with pride um, of what was happening. The album also has very anti-Semitic captions, so obviously that message was also um, delivered this way. Um, Strop was prosecuted during the Dachau trials and then extradited to Poland where he was tried, convicted, and executed for crimes against humanity. Now, um, this is another um, graphic picture. What you are looking at is a mass grave, an execution pit, um, where Jewish women from the Mizoch ghetto in today's Belarus were executed. Those executions were carried out by um, the Einsatzgruppen, so-called mobile killing squads. Um, these were units that followed the German army into the occupied territories with one goal, to get rid of the enemy. Partisans, communists, Roma and Sinti, and Jews. Um, Jews uh, were the largest number of victims, according to the latest research, over two million men, women, and children were shot in those executions. As you can see here, there are German policemen inside this execution pit, um, making sure that they will shoot to death those women who survived the initial shooting. They were not hit by a bullet. Um, so the police um, who were supposed to um, serve and protect and were neutral professionals when the Nazis came to power, over time turned into some of the worst perpetrators during the Holocaust, um, taking part in mass shootings and writing home how proud they were um, for what they were doing, that they were getting rid of the enemy. They described in detail to their wives um, what they did. This is another picture of another execution. You can see how close the executioners were. Um, Obviously, there were also local collaborators helping the Germans with the executions. And um, what you are looking is an execution, again, in broad daylight. And this is not a secret. These individuals were not deported to camps. They were not put on trains. They were taken from their homes in broad daylight in front of their non-Jewish neighbors and walked over to an execution site and murdered. Now, how did Jews respond to those photographs, to the camera being used as a weapon? Um, you are looking here at Adam Chernyakov. He was um, the head of the Jewish council in the Warsaw Ghetto. Warsaw Ghetto was the largest ghetto during the Holocaust. And if you read his diary, and I hope you will, uh, you will read about film crews, German film crews, coming to the Warsaw Ghetto uh, to shoot propaganda materials. So um, in his um, diary entries, he describes how they staged photos, how they ridiculed Jews in order to, again, match their ideas uh, about Jews. In this picture, you are looking at Chernyakov's office um, and there is a menorah um, standing there, but it's a Hanukkah. It's a menorah that's used for the holiday of Hanukkah, which is a winter holiday. That picture was taken in May. Um, for the Nazis, they would use anything that matched their uh, um, perception of Jews. It didn't matter if it was accurate or not. Um, they tried in those propaganda films and photographs to show that Jews are to blame themselves for the situation in the ghettos. Again, that they are vermin, that they are parasites. And um, it's very interesting to read how ghetto residents saw that happening and their responses to it. By the way, Chernyakov, when the deportations started um, 
to the death camp in Treblinka from the Warsaw Ghetto in July of 1942. Uh, he took his own life. Now, another, uh, um, another example from the ghettos um, it come, comes from the Lodge Ghetto, and I want to talk to you about two photographers, Jewish photographers, in the Lodge Ghetto. We talked about um, the photographers on the side of the perpetrators earlier. Um, Henrik Ross, who, whose image you can see on the left, um, was um, a professional photographer before the war. He worked for the Polish press. And when he um, found himself in the ghetto, he uh, found a job with the Department of Statistics. So he had an official camera. He was expected to take pictures for the Jewish administration of the ghetto. Um, also ID pictures um, of ghetto residents, but he also took illegal pictures of life in the ghetto. He took pictures like the one in the middle um, of joyful moment. There is a mother with a baby. Um, she was a, uh, the wife of a Jewish policeman. And um, horrific moments like the, the image on the right where Jews um, are being deported from Lodge to the death camp in Helmno. Um, that was the first death camp uh, with mobile um, gas chambers, gas bands. Um, in which uh, victims would be killed. Um, and that's one of the images he took of the deportation. We are looking at a human being um, at the very um, center of the photo and other um, people in the background about to be deported to their deaths. They would be lied to that they're being resettled to live and work elsewhere, but um, they would be going to their deaths. Now, I mentioned ID pictures. Uh, you may be wondering, how did they get film um, in the ghetto? Obviously, it, it was very hard to, to obtain. Um, Henrik Ross came up with the idea of building this platform for ID pictures. So instead of using one frame for one ID picture, he would take a group picture and then crop um, uh, the individuals uh, for each photograph and use the rest of the film that he saved for his illegal pictures. He wanted to document what was going on in the ghetto. Um, after the Holocaust, um, the, um, the pictures that showed the horrific um, uh, side of life in the ghetto uh, became known. The pictures with the, with the um, more positive um, stories had to wait um, several decades before they, they became known. But um, Ross survived and he cataloged his own pictures um, after the war. So um, it's incredible. I encourage you to research him. You can see amazing um, collection of photographs at Yad Vashem and on other sites. Um, so um, that's an example when the camera was used um, to resist the Nazis. Another photographer from the same ghetto, Mendel Grossman, you can see his self-portrait here on the left, um, was also a professional photographer and also worked in the statistical department in the same ghetto. Um, he would take pic official pictures that was expected of him, but would also take pictures on the streets of strangers. Um, he had an ethical dilemma if it's the right thing to do to show somebody suffering, but actually one of the people he uh, photographed encouraged him to do that, to keep a trace of evidence one day so that people could know what was happening in the ghetto. He also took pictures of his family. He lived in crowded conditions um, with his parents, his sisters, brother-in-law, and his little nephew, you can see Yankel or Yankush here um, at the, in the left-hand corner um, with the star. Um, and his sister Feige is, is waiting in line, um, uh, waiting for food. When you research on your own um, Grossman's pictures, you will see how the condition of his relatives deteriorated over time. Eventually, um, one by one, they would die. And um, Yankush, that little nephew, died of starvation, of hunger in 1943. Grossman also photographed deportations. Um, in the picture on the right, 
You can see him taking a picture of the deportation to the death camp in Helmna. Uh, the Jewish policeman is standing with his back. Um, a Grossman's assistant took the picture. Um, and we can see um, Grossman actively documenting what was going on. And on the left, um, it's a really powerful photo. It shows a young woman who is being deported um, to the death camp in Helmna. She's writing a note um, before she boards the train. Um, you can see her star as well. Speaking about death camps, uh, you may be wondering, were there any pictures um, from the death camps? Um, I will show you a few examples. I will start with the so-called Zonder Commando photos. Um, and by the way, Grossman did not survive. Uh, he was deported to another camp and on a death march, he could not walk anymore. And like other prisoners on death marches, when they couldn't walk, when they tripped, they would be killed um, by the Germans and um, he was murdered. Apparently he still had his camera um, with him. Um, one sister who survived uh, retrieved the hidden photographs and sent them to one of the kibbutzim. But during the War of Independence, um, they were lost. So the only photographs that survived are, were prints that Grossman was handing out to people and another um, uh, uh, group of photographs that one of his friends um, managed to um, discover um, after the war. Now, going back to photographs uh, from death camps, um, you are looking at two photographs that were taken in 1944 in August. Um, there are two more. So four pictures total um, taken by members of the Sonderkommando at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz had three parts, Auschwitz I, then Auschwitz II, um, known as Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was a death camp, and Auschwitz III, uh, Buna Monowitz. Sonderkommandos were commandos where um, prisoners from incoming transports uh, were forced to help with the killing process. They would um, take prisoners um, or um, new arrivals to a gas chamber, pull their bodies out, um, look for valuables, look for um, gold teeth, um, burn the bodies, sort uh, through the clothes. They would be murdered periodically as potential witnesses and other um, uh, prisoners would be selected from an incoming transport. Um, death, uh, uh, death camps were death factories. So the majority of, of people arriving in death camps would be gassed upon arrival. Um, Auschwitz uh, Birkenau was the largest death camp and uh, five members of the Sonderkommando in 1944 decided to take the risk and try to take pictures. Um, we don't see the gassing itself, but um, you can see um, in this picture on the left, uh, you can see Jewish women um, being taken to the gas chamber. Um, they're naked. Um, they are being forced to uh, the gas chamber where they will perish. And the picture on the right shows um, the burning of the bodies of those who are already gassed. Now, two pictures were taken from the outside and two pictures were taken from the inside of the gas chamber. Um, the one on the right is from the um, inside, that's why you see a black frame, um, and the one on the left was taken outside. Uh, now, Alberto Herrera, the first name on the list, is the um, prisoner who actually took um, the picture. Um, but the other prisoners whose names I listed were equally important because they had to be on the lookout. There were guards, obviously, in the camp. Um, there were other prisoners who could betray them. So they were risking a lot to do this. But those four photographs were taken. And um, uh, Helena Danton, I put her name there as well because, I, again, um, her name is not very well known. Um, she worked in the SS canteen and she put um, the film in a toothpaste tube that was smuggled by the Polish resistance and uh, um, uh, smuggled outside. And um, that's how the pictures um, made it um, outside the camp. And to this day, we can learn from those photographs. Um, now, um, Alberto did not survive, um, but we know what happened from the testimony of the other members of, of the group. 
Uh, so we know the story behind how difficult it was to even try to do this, and, uh, and they were able to take those four photo photographs. Um, I mentioned that um, death camps were um, death factories. Those prisoners who would be selected uh, for gassing would not be registered, but those who were selected for work would be registered, um, and their pictures were taken. Um, so um, you are looking at um, some of those pictures. There were three poses, and on the left is a professional photographer who was part of the department at Auschwitz, um, which was located in Auschwitz I. There was a studio and a dark room. Um, it was run by the SS, um, but other um, uh, photographers were included um, from among prisoners, um, pro um, uh, profession, pre war professional photographers. So Brasse was, Wilhelm Brasse was one of them. He took um, between 40,000 and 50,000 pictures. And um, when the camp was being evacuated, um, the uh, head of the department, Ber Ber um, uh, Bernhard Walter, um, told him or gave him an order and another prisoner who was a photographer um, to destroy the photographs. Uh, the Soviets were coming. They they wanted the uh, the SS wanted the photographs to be um, destroyed. What uh, Brasse did with the other prisoner was they put wet uh, photographic paper inside the stove uh, with some wet pictures and then put um, uh, the pictures in. So the fire did not really catch on. And out of around two hundred thousand photographs, around fifty thousand survived. Um, uh, Brasses did survive. He was um, sent to another camp in Ebenze and um, liberated by the Americans. He went home after the war and um, was unable to take a single picture because of what he witnessed. Um, he was also forced to take pictures of Mengele's experiments on twins. Um, so he had to change his profession because he was unable to be a photographer anymore. Now, I mentioned that department run by the, ran by the SS. The head of it was um, Bernard um, Walter. Um, Ernst Hoffmann was his um, deputy. And um, Walter was in Auschwitz uh, from January 1941 uh, to January 1945, so a long time. Um, he um, previously, before coming to Auschwitz, was also the head of the same department in Sachsenhausen uh, with Rudolf Hess, um, the Auschwitz commandant, um, late, uh, who became um, the Auschwitz commandant. And um, those um, two men, Hoffmann and Walter, took pictures that you can see in the so-called Auschwitz album. That was an album that was uh, created um, um, during the deportations of Hungarian Jews um, to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Hungarian Jews were deported very late in 1944. Um, between May and July, um, over 400,000 innocent human beings were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau and murdered. Um, later on, during a post-war trial, Walter admitted taking some of the pictures. Now, the album looks um, like um, the page on the left or the slide on the left. Uh, there are images on uh, 56 pages, over 190 photographs. They show um, the arrival um, of uh, Hungarian Jews. Um, they show the ramp with German personnel and then um, the deportees with their belongings. Again, they were deceived that they would be working um, and living someplace else. Um, they show those prisoners who were selected for work, um, who, were, uh, who had their um, tattoo camp um, number tattooed on their uh, forearm, um, their heads were shaved, and um, they show children, adults. Um, in the picture on the right, you see a woman walking with children um, towards the gas chamber. And how this album was found was that a prisoner 
um, from um, that transport uh, was sent to another uh, camp, Dora Middlebau, and um, at the time of liberation, she found this album. Um, she was 18. Um, she, left, uh, she, she lived through the um, album and recognized herself in the pictures. You can see her here in the front row. Um, this lady here in the middle group, if you count to four from the left. Um, she recognized her brothers in the picture on the left. Those brothers were sent to the gas chamber. She recognized neighbors, friends. Um, so she took that album with her. She ended up living in the United States and survivors would um, visit her. Um, she would show them the album. So some um, uh, pictures are missing because she would give them to the people who recognize themselves or their loved ones. Um, and uh, eventually, Serge Klarsfeld, um, a very well-known Nazi hunter, um, advised her to donate the album to Yad Vashem uh, where it was um, uh, protected by the archivists. And those, uh, those pictures became public, more people became, um, were identified. Uh, so if you, if you research the Auschwitz album, you will be able to see more photo photographs. Now, I want to contrast this album with another album from that time. Um, in uh, 2007, um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. received a donation. Um, the donation was an album um, uh, from a U.S. Um, veteran from World War II who wanted to remain anonymous. And um, it shows um, official pictures from ceremonies, but also um, pictures from uh, a resort for the personnel of the Auschwitz camp. Um, uh, and um, you can see uh, the owner of the album, the staff at the museum in Washington, through looking at the pictures um, and the patches on the uniforms and the captions figured out that um, that's the owner. Even though his name is not there in the captions, if he was with someone, he would say with this and that. So it's obvi he's obviously talking about himself. He was um, the adjutant to the um, uh, Auschwitz com uh, uh, commander and uh, commandant. And uh, his name was Carl Hecker. Um, he worked at a bank before the Holocaust and um, um, then ended up in Auschwitz um, as uh, the adjutant or the assistant to, to the um, uh, uh, commandant and um, took pictures in this album. So you can see striking photos like the one on the left where you see Nazi leadership, including Mengele, um, singing along. There is music, there is an accordion, um, they are singing along, rejoicing, um, having a good time. There are pictures like the one on the left with uh, female auxiliaries, women, German women who were stenographers and typists, um, and uh, they are having fun, eating blueberries, um, having music again, laughing. Christmas celebration. This is Hacker himself lighting a Christmas tree at the same time when people were tortured and killed not far away from this resort. Um, that album, um, the pictures end in December, but it does um, show pictures from the time frame when the Hungarian transports were coming um, in the spring and summer. Um, of 1944. So those individuals who we see in Hacker album were having fun, singing along at the same time when Hungarian Jews were being murdered. I told you that I would bring this picture back. Magda and her two daughters were on one of those transports of Hungarian Jews. 
She was 38 at the time. Emilia, her, young, her younger daughter, was six. And mothers with children, with young children, would be sent to gas as unable to, to work. Um, so Magda and Emilia were sent to gas right away. Judith was a teenager at the time, so she survived. She was selected for work and then transferred to other camps. She had the strength to share her story after the Holocaust. She was a speaker at our museum. We lost her a few years ago, but uh, prior to that, she spoke at the museum all the time and shared the information of what happened to Magda, Emilia, and others during the Holocaust. Now I want to focus why it's so important to talk to survivors about what they experienced, to get the information from them, get their testimony. Lots of execution sites look like this. This is a picture from um, Belarus. It was taken by the team um, from Yahad in Unum, an organization that investigates um, mass shootings during the Holocaust, the so-called Holocaust by bullets that we talked earlier about. Um, some of those sites are marked often with misinformation because of communist era. Um, some are parking lots today. Some are fields without any marking, like in this picture. Without talking to survivors, there are few survivors of the Holocaust by bullets, but without talking to them and without talking to non-Jewish neighbors, witnesses, and that's what Yahad Inunum does. Um, Yahad Inunum teams go and interview um, the neighbors who are elderly um, today. They are able to locate those execution sites. So we need to talk to witnesses and survivors. Um, we need to talk about photographs that survivors have. I'm showing you here one of the artifacts at our museum. Uh, this is an autograph book that um, Ellen Bernstein, one of our survivors, brought with her when she was escaping from Germany with her parents. Um, they were escaping persecution and came to the United States. Um, she gave this autograph book to her friends and family, um, and they each wrote a note. Some notes are in English because they knew that she's coming to the United States. Um, what you're looking at is a picture, because some people who, uh, who put their notes in the autograph book, they also put pictures. And this is um, uh, Lotte. She was Ellen's cousin. And she left a note as well. So thanks to Ellen giving us that autograph book, we have the handwriting of this person. We have the picture. Lotte did not survive. But thanks to this um, artifact, we are able to see her face, see her handwriting. We believe at our museum that um, uh, artifacts have biographies because there is so much information. But without Ellen, we wouldn't know what happened to Lotta. We wouldn't have any stories about her. Another example why it's so crucial to talk to survivors is this picture from our collection. Obviously shows people in the summer gathered together. Um, it was donated by Mary Wygotsky, one of our um, speakers in our Speakers Bureau, a Holocaust survivor who lost everyone in the Holocaust. And we sat down with Mary to um, ask her about individuals in this picture and other pictures. This is the result. Um, Mary and her daughter, Charlene Wygotsky, gave us information about every person in this picture their name, what happened to them. Um, obviously, there is Mary herself as a child in the middle, but you can see the dates of death next to so many names. Without Mary, without her memory, we would never be able to identify these individuals. Another example, um, Toni Rindy in the middle. She's another Holocaust survivor from our museum, um, also speaks to school groups um, and adults with an incredible rescue story. Um, but until recently, Tony knew part of her res rescue story, how she was helped by a stranger um, during the Holocaust. Um, she's actually in this picture with the cat of the rescuer. Um, the rescuer's name was Zofia Konyosna. Recently, um, through research at our museum, I'm in charge of education, but I also do research um, 
So um, we were able to identify more rescuers involved in helping Tony's family. We were able to obtain some photographs of the rescuers. See, on the left, you see Roman Sagelin, a young man who gave shelter to Tony and her family and other Jews escaping persecution. Um, you see his sister-in-law, Stanislava Sagelin, on the right. Um, we don't have the picture of Roman's brother, so um, it shows how many gaps there are in, in um, collecting evidence, but what we have already added new layers to Tony's story. Um, she was able to reconnect with the son of, of um, two of her rescuers, and we also have their pictures, uh, Michał and Katarzyna Gerula, um, who were murdered for helping Jews, including Tony's family. Roman was also murdered, betrayed by his neighbor, betrayed by his neighbor. Um, but it shows that his, this history is still living. There are still layers to be uncovered, including photographs. And again, without talking to the relatives of those rescuers, Stanislava survived. She's no longer with us, but um, uh, her son is alive. So he was able to share the pictures with us and, and incredible pieces of information for Tony. Another example how um, we can uh, provide information for survivors and retrieve identities of those who perished. Um, another of our survivors, Ed Herman, came to me with the name of his aunt, his dad's sister, um, Ferka Herman. He knew that she disappeared during the Holocaust. He assumed she perished, but he had no information. Eventually, he found this um, pre-war picture. Again, the picture when people lived um, Ferka is sitting here. Um, I was able to retrieve her date of birth and did extensive research, um, found um, residence uh, registration cards for Ferka and her mother from the Lodge Ghetto with the addresses where they lived. Um, other documentation, including um, an application for an exemption from um, uh, the deportations, and FERCA was granted um, the um, exemption. Um, a few years ago, I was able to travel to Lodge. Um, the buildings where she lived are still standing, so that's one of the addresses where she still lived with her mother, and this is the address where she lived on her own and from, and from where she was eventually deported. So that exemption did not uh, protect her. Um, and uh, it protected her for a while, but it did not protect her completely. And uh, in 1944, she was deported to the death camp in Helmno, about which we talked about. Um, she stayed in the ghetto for so long and uh, was able to survive for so long. And yet, in the end, she was deported. Um, we found this um, in the Lodge archives, we found these, um, this ID. You can see um, Ferka's address, the very one um, that you can see here with the building um, that was up for demolition when I was taking a picture of it. Uh, you can see her signature, which is priceless for the family. Um, you can see the description of what she did in the ghetto, that she was a weaver. You remember the picture with straw boots? She was one of the, of the ghetto residents who were working in that uh, workshop. So she was making straw boots for German soldiers. And I want to draw your attention to her picture. Do you see that there is something behind her? No? Do you remember? Yes, the group photo. Um, so this is the platform that Henrik Ross built. So you can see the hands of people above her uh, who are being photographed for the IDs. So you can see that piece of history in that little photo as well. And we can connect it um, to, um, to Ferka's story. Now, I want to close with this picture from our museum. Um, you can see the boxcar, our main artifact, and images on the wall showing um, some survivors and some of those who perished during the Holocaust. When you come to the museum, I encourage you to go up to that wall. You will see 
uh, Magda Sass and Emilia there, you will see other individuals. And it helps us to translate history into individual lives. We can see life before, you can see faces, names, the perpetrators and their collaborators tried to eradicate Jews, annihilate every single Jewish person, Jewish culture, Jewish history. So for those who were selected for work, they would turn them into numbers. They no longer had names, identities. We do the opposite. We do research and retrieve those identities. Um, whenever there are photographs, we try to identify who is in those, in those photos. By um, listening to this presentation today, you became witnesses to this history as well, and to these images. There is so much more to research, and I encourage you to do that. Um, you can look um, at pictures from A. Shishok, um, Lepaya, Vili Gerok's photos. Um, you can read about Wendy Lauer's research. So there is so much more to see. Obviously, the presentation has its time limits, um, but I hope I inspired you to do your, um, to do your research. We saw um, horrific pictures today. Um, we saw trophy pictures of the soldiers who were so proud of what they were doing. We saw resistance through taking pictures among Jews who wanted to make sure that there is evidence of what was happening. Um, now, I want to... Uh, remind everybody that the individuals that we saw in those photographs were human beings, including the perpetrators. They were not um, some robots um, pre-programmed to kill. They were not monsters from another planet. They were human beings who chose to hate and to kill. Genocide ends with violence, whether it's a mass shooting, gassing, or any other form of violence, but it starts with ideas, misconceptions, perceptions. We need to be careful as human beings, and I'm going back to that second part of our mission statement that I discussed earlier. We need to be careful to draw lessons and to be able to check our own perceptions, um, stop for a second and think how we perceive other people, whether it's our next door neighbor or somebody thousands of miles away. How do we think about other people? We need to be able as human beings to respond early before it escalates and that ends up with violence. So it's a huge responsibility. Um, we need to use these pictures responsibly. We always need to check the source, um, think about the motivation, find out who the photographer was, if possible. And uh, for those of you who work in education, that's absolutely crucial to be able to use um, uh, primary sources responsibly in the classroom. Um, and we need to remember about the responsibility we carry um, of passing on the legacy of those victims who try to leave evidence of what happened to them so that they are not forgotten. The crime is not forgotten. And the lives of those who perished are remembered. So thank you so much um, for your attention. I'm ready to take questions. And uh, I hope we have some questions. <laughs> Um, that's a huge question. 
Um, by the way, we have a, a lecture series on anti-Semitism at the museum, so I encourage you to check our website. Um, but to answer the question, yes, anti-Semitism still exists um, in Europe, in the United States. Um, lots of Jews feel threatened, and um, there is talk about even about leaving um, uh, in various countries. There are Jewish people who are afraid to wear a kippah on their head because they are afraid to, uh, of being targeted on the streets in Western Europe and um, in Eastern Europe. So yes, it exists. Um, and with the uh, different political um, scenarios um, where some politicians try to rewrite the Holocaust history, that's another threat and another um, a challenge that historians have to face to, to be able to preserve the truth um, in spite of the political pressure. So yes, it still exists. Um, I don't have to tell you about the attack on our museum um, not a long ago, a few weeks ago, where um, uh, there was an anti-Semitic um, slogan written on our building in 2021. Um, on the wall of the Florida Holocaust Museum. But at the same time, the, there is so much support, um, and our museum received so much support from the community and words of encouragement. So there are both, and uh, we need to try to educate as much as possible um, our communities so that people are aware that anti-Semitism anti is still alive and how we can prevent it from spreading and um, affecting other people. We have another question. Um, how has photographic evidence changed our understanding of the history of the Holocaust? Um, that's a, a great question. And again, we could do another session just um, on that. Well, first of all, um, some of, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, some of the photographs were used in the post-war trials, the Nuremberg trials and other trials. So um, that was um, a piece of evidence that was not destroyed that would, could prove that something happened. Uh, we also learned about other forms of, um, in addition to armed resistance among Jews, we also learned about other forms of resistance um, the unarmed resistance, like taking pictures that Henry Cross or Mendel Grossman um, uh, left um, for us. So we can see what happened. But to me personally, one of the biggest lessons from these pictures is that it's part of humanity, a very dark part, and a warning that human beings are capable of making horrific choices. And we all are responsible of the way we perceive and respond to other people. Those pictures are a reminder. When you look at Magda and Emilia, innocent mother and her young daughter, and yet another human being made a choice to hate them, to perceive them as less than human, and to murder them. Some of the perpetrators from the Holocaust, I told you earlier, wrote letters home and they describe how they murdered innocent people, including children, at the same time asking their spouses about their own children at home. So they are loving fathers on one side and husbands, and in the same letter, the same person is describing in detail how he murdered innocent human beings because to him they are no longer people, they are subhumans, the enemy, a threat. So we need to be very careful um, about our choices in everyday life. And those photographs are a constant reminder. They also show us the life that was lost. That's why our museum collects photographs, pre-war photographs, because we want to keep a trace of that world. And as I said, we interview survivors, collect their testimony, and also ask them to identify individuals in, in the photographs um, that they submit. By the way, our collection um, of artifacts uh, is available on our website, so you can uh, look through the database um, and by keyword uh, look at different photographs and other artifacts. Well, thank you very much, and please join me in um, giving another round of applause for the Thank you very much.
Thank you.